lesson tonight is out of Isaiah chapter 43. Fear not my witnesses. Verse 1 says, Thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. And so right off, we, we do see in context, God is speaking through Isaiah to Jacob and to Israel. These are wonderful promises. Fear not. For I have redeemed you. So he gives us the reason not to fear. He doesn't say, well, just fear not. But he gives us a reason that we don't have to fear because God has already redeemed us. I have. Past tense. Even when Isaiah was writing. And we see Isaiah used that term before, that phrase before. God is our redeemer. He has already redeemed us. Even though Isaiah wrote before the Messiah came to this earth, the Messiah's work was completed even before the foundation of the world because as far as God was concerned, in God's mind, it's a done deal when God said that the lamb would be slain from the foundation of the earth. The price has been paid. We have been redeemed. Thus we don't have to fear. We have nothing to fear. O Jacob, O Israel, he has called us by name. By what name? Jacob or Israel? Both. By Jacob, the deceiver, the supplanter, the sinner, God has redeemed us. And he has redeemed us and has called us Israel, a prince with God, an overcomer with God. He has transformed us. He has changed us. In those two names is the whole gospel. God loves us while we're sinners, but he loves us too much to leave us as sinners. He forgives us, and then he changes us and changes our name, changes our character, changes our mind, changes our desires, changes our actions, changes our lives. And those that are selfish, grabbing for themselves, competing, fighting, he has redeemed us from that and has give, made us overcomers with God and man. Princes with him. And thus we are his. You are mine. Says the Lord. Well that's a wonderful promise. We are his. Thus we don't have to fear. Fear not. Fear not. Direct promise from God. A direct commandment from God. Fear not not. I will not fear because I am God, because he has redeemed me, because he has called me. Verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And though through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Some more wonderful promises. No matter what you're going through, if it seems like the water is just getting higher and higher, things just keep on piling, on piling on top of each other, things just seem to get worse and worse, whatever the circumstance, whatever the situation. He says, don't worry. Fear not. For it will not overflow you. God doesn't promise a, a life without problems. But it does not have to overflow us. It does not have to overtake us. It does not have to overwhelm us. As we believe his promise, I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. He is our Savior. He will save us. He will deliver us. He will help us. And he is the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel. So as we go through the struggles of this life, keep going through. As you go through the waters, as you go through the trials, as, as, as you've heard maybe the saying, if you're going through hell, don't stop. Yeah. Right? Keep going. It will not overflow you. It will not overtake you. 
as you trust in God. He will give us his peace. He will give us faith. He will give us courage. He will give us strength. And he will see us through. Fear not them that can destroy the body. But rather fear him who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. Fear the Lord. Do not fear the troubles of this world. Verse 4, since you are precious in my sight, you have been honored and I have loved you. The Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, the Holy One of Israel, he loves us. He calls us by name. Individually, personally, no matter what we've been through, no matter what our past, he loves us. And we are precious in his sight. How precious in his sight are we? Is it because, well, we, we, we've done this and we've done that and we have the ability to do this and we have the potential to do that? Is that what makes us precious? Is it our degrees? Is it, is it our learning? Is it our accomplishments? Is it how many friends we have on Facebook? Is it, what, what is, we are precious in his sight. We are valuable in his sight. Our value is in the price that was paid for us. And God paid himself. As Abraham told Isaac, the Lord himself will provide the sacrifice. The Lord has provided himself as the sacrifice for us. The Lord has provided himself as a payment for us. Thus we are precious in his sight. Our value in his sight is the value of himself. That's how much he values us. That's how much he loves us. God loves us as much as he loves himself. So when he says, love your neighbor as yourself, he doesn't ask us to do anything he hasn't already done. He has already loved us as he loves himself. What a wonderful promise. For God so loves you that he gave himself for you. Thus, we don't have to fear. No matter what the struggles, no matter what the floods, no matter what the fires, no matter what the problems, fear not. Fear not. Again, verse 5, fear not. For I am with you and I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. To the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons and my daughters from afar, from the end of the earth, all who are called by my name, whom I created for my glory. Again, in context and in fulfillment of prophecy, God is talking about Israel. Jacob. But certainly, God's promises apply to all who attach themselves to Israel as well, whom he has created for his glory. So we don't have to fear. Why? Because I am with you. Because God is with us. All right? If someone was harassing you and... Uh, you got some security locks on your doors and bulletproof windows on your house, right? Would you feel more secure? More is a general term, right? I think I'd feel more secure, right? And what if you uh, were able to hire some bodyguards and maybe even police officers and, and they, they, they stood guard at your house, even surrounded your house? Would you feel safer from some punk who threatened you? You had 10 police officers, 20 police officers and bodyguards surrounding your house? you feel safer? I would. Because with locks on the doors and everything, right? I'd feel safer in the house. Well, those pale in comparison to having God with us. He says, fear not, for I am with you. And he will never leave us, and he will never forsake us. Fear not. So what fears has Satan been bringing into your mind? 
Fear about the future? Fear about the past? Fear about some situation you're going through, whether financial or health or some social situation, some problem with your marriage or with some friends or with your family? What are the fears that Satan tries to conjure up? What are the real struggles you're facing? What is the real floods of water that seem to be overtaking you? What insecurities, the unknowns in our lives? Whatever it is, we can choose by faith to fear not. Because God has promised to be with us. He is with us. He is with us here in the room. He's with us when we leave. He's with us when we go home. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He promises to bring our descendants all together. There'll be a gathering day. There'll be a gathering time. And God has miraculously done this. I mean, when Isaiah is writing this, Israel, the well, Israel in the north might have been by this time, but Judah had not been dispersed yet. He's prophesying that there's going to be a dispersion, and he's promising a regathering. And we see centuries later, God has gathered us together into a nation again. It's miraculous. I don't think that's ever happened to any other people group. It's miraculous. That the descendants from thousands of years ago that were attacked uh, sometime after Isaiah with Babylon coming in, and he brought us back. Attacked again under the Romans, dispersed, and God has brought us back and brought the language back. It's miraculous. God promised it, and he has fulfilled it. And thus, he has, since he has promised in the past, and has fulfilled his word, we can have assurance for the future as well. He is with us. And he will gather us all together. He will gather us and take us up to the new Jerusalem that he's preparing for us. And he'll create a new heavens and new earth and bring us all back in the gathering place. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. And he'll send his angels to gather the elect from one end of the earth to the other. He will gather us together. From the ends of the earth, all who are called by his name. So not only does he know us by name and calls us by name, he calls us by his name. Right? Traditionally, when, when a woman marries a man, she takes on his name. God marries us and he gives us his name. When a couple adopts a child, they, the child takes on their name. God is giving us his name. He's saying, you are mine. You are equal with me. You're part of my family. You and I are one. He calls us by his name. What a privilege. What an honor. To be called by his name. And he created us for his glory. And if he created us for his glory, then he will glorify himself through us. He will do things through us that will bring him honor and glory. He will do powerful things through us. He will transform us and he will change us so that he is reflected through us to bring honor and glory to him. He will give us victory over the temptations. He will deliver us from the problems. He will make us like himself. He will make us loving. He will make us kind. He will give us the ability to love our neighbors and to love our enemies. He will live his life through us. He has created us and really recreated us for a special purpose, for his plan, to bring honor and glory to him. What a privilege. What an honor. What an assignment. What a responsibility. 
But all that he promises and all that he commands, he is able to do through us. Verse 8, bring out the blind people who have eyes and the deaf who have ears. Who can declare the future? Let them bring out their witnesses that they may be justified. Who else has declared the future? Who else can tell the future? Who else would prophesy a dispersion and a regathering? Who else would describe and, and prophesy the things that God has done and has fulfilled it? Does anyone else have a track record like God? Do, the, do the, the crystal ball readers and the palm readers, do the statues and the idols, do they have a track record like this? Yeah, God invented the track and he sets the standard. 100%. Do the horoscopes and the, uh, the predictors of this world, do they, are they able to tell the future like God is? If they are, they should invest in the stock market. I mean, you know, I mean. <laughs> and demonstrate how well they know the future. But God knows. And God has testified. Thus, because he has such a great record, we can trust him. And if he says, fear not, we don't have to fear. Verse 10, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Our salvation is in God and in no one else. It's not in our good works. It's not in our good actions. Our salvation is in the price that Messiah has paid for us. The redemption that he did for us, the work that he did for us. Not only does he save us from the record of our sins, he saves us from the power of those sins. He saves us not only from Satan's grasp, pulling us down to destruction. He saves us from Satan's hold so that we can have victory and deliverance and new lives in the Messiah. Twofold deliverance, twofold salvation that he has provided for us. Theological terms, sanctifica uh, justification and sanctification. He does both works. He is our Savior, and there's none other who can do it. There was none before him and none after him. He is the one. And we are his witnesses of this. He has chosen us. Why has he chosen us? To put us on a pedestal? Chosen us so we can have a little piece of land in the middle of a desert? Is that why he has chosen us? He chose us to be hated. He chose us so that we can eke out a, a 70 80, 90 year life? Why did he choose us? For his, glory. For his glory, because he loves us, and to be his witnesses. With the chosenness, with the calling, comes a responsibility. It's not just a label. He has chosen us. Right? If you're on the playground and they choose you to be on their team, they have a purpose for you. <laughs> to be the pitcher or to be the first baseman or whatever. We're chosen for a purpose. And God chose us individually, personally, and corporately to be his witnesses, to give glory to him, to witness about him. Right? In court cases, you have witnesses and they testify about what they've seen, about what they've heard, about what they've experienced. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. That's what he wants us to testify. That we know him, that we believe in him, that we've experienced him, that we've tested him, that we've tried his promises and we have found them sure and true in our lives. And that we understand that he is the only Savior. He took away my fear. What a testimony. Right, we tell someone that, someone's going through problems, someone's going through anxiety, they're going through worries, they're going through issues. 
The doctors want to put them on all kinds of meds because they're worried. And you say, well, I gave my problems to God. I surrendered them to him. I surrendered my fears to him. I trusted that he would protect me. I trusted that he would be with me. And he took away my fear. I have known him. I believed in him. I took him at his word. And the fear is gone. And this is how the situation then ends working out. I understand that he is the one. What a testimony. That's what he wants us to witness to. How he has worked in our lives. We've overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. We have to believe, we have to experience God's power in our lives. And then we have to tell others of that experience. We have to mingle among people and get to know them to the point that they open up their problems so that we can tell them of the one and only solution and tell them our testimony, God's testimony, God's story in our lives. That's what he's created us for, to give glory to him. That's why he's called us. That's why he's chosen us, to give glory to him, to know him, to believe in him, and to understand that he is the Lord God. None before him, none after him, none like him. The only one, the one and only, Believe means to put all our weight upon him, to trust him. And when he says, fear not, to believe means to stop fearing. That's what real belief is. Real trust is. Someone convinced you to go parasailing with them. They told you it was safe. <laughs> they had done it before. To believe them is to then do it. Believe is stepping out in faith. Trusting that God means what he says. Verse 12, I have declared and saved. I have proclaimed Therefore you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Indeed, before the day was, I am he, and there was no one, there was no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work, and who will reverse it? He is the one. He has declared himself. He has saved us. He has already redeemed us. He has proclaimed that he has done it. He has demonstrated, therefore, we are his witnesses of it. We've seen it, we've experienced it, thus we should testify about it, that he is God. There's no one who can do what he does. And when he purposes something, there's no one who can stop what he sets out to do. Verse 14, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, twice, your Redeemer, he's our Redeemer, he's redeemed us. The Holy One of Israel. Again, second time. Important terms. And for your sake, I will send to Babylon and bring down their pride. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your king. He mentions Babylon here, and this is before Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem. Again, Isaiah is prophesying. God is telling. God is proclaiming. And just from that alone, within this chapter, he said, I am he and I will do and no one can stop what I did, even though Nebuchadnezzar said, look at this great city Babylon that I have built. God said, I'm going to bring them down. Way hundreds of years before in Isaiah, I'm going to bring down his pride. And he did. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind for seven years. 
And then when he got it back, he humbled himself before the Lord. God brought down his pride. And if God knew that ahead of time for Babylon, for Nebuchadnezzar, God knows our future as well. God knows your future as well. He knows the waters you're going to go through. He knows the fires you're going to go through. But just like Daniel's friends, Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah, he will be with us in the fires, and it shall not burn you. No smell of smoke they came out. The ropes were not burned. Their hair was not singed. God was with them, and God will be with us as well. He promised. That doesn't mean they never died. Daniel eventually died. The other three eventually died. In God's time. In God's time. And in God's time only. Right. No one else is going to be able to set that time frame. God and God alone. I mean, of course, we could destroy our own body. He lets us do to ourselves what we want. But when God's got a purpose and God's got a plan, he's not going to let the devil come and shorten it. Unless we give the devil permission. Again, we've got free choice. He is the Lord, the Holy One, the creator of Israel. He is the one who creates. He is the one who's made us overcomers with him. He is our king. He is the king and the only king. And he brings down the pride of this world, the proud of this world. Verse 16, thus says the Lord, who makes a path in the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power, they shall not rise, they are extinguished, they are quenched like a wick. Here he's referring back to, no doubt, to our deliverance out of Egypt. He made a way through the sea, he parted the Red Sea, he made a path through the mighty waters, we walked through, they did not overflow us. They came at us with the horses and the chariots, and God brought them down. And they shall not rise. He extinguished them, and they, they are quenched. They put out like a, like a candle. As the problems you're facing, the fears that Satan's trying to stir up in your mind, are they greater than the Pharaoh and the Egyptian army, and the Red Sea behind them, nowhere to escape, the walls of the mountains on either side. Defenseless with children and flocks against the mighty army of Egypt. Maybe your problem is bigger than that. But whether it is or isn't, there is no problem that's bigger than God. He'll part the seas and he'll take us through, and he'll see us through to the promised land. And the wicked will be buried under the army and their power, and they shall not rise. Verse 18, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall, shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God is literally doing that in Israel, in the land. And he's doing it in our lives as well. He's doing a new thing. Behold, I created a new thing. All things shall become new. The former things are passed away. The Jacob of our old lives the deception and deceit of our old lives its passed away. It's gone. Don't give the excuse, well, I'm human and I'm fail and human nature. Behold, all things become new. He changes us, he transforms us, makes us Israel. Princes and princes with God. Overcomers with him. He makes all things new. Verse 20, the beast of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the deserts to give drink to my people, my chosen. 
This people I have formed for myself, they shall declare my praise. He has chosen us to be witnesses to declare his praise. And if we don't, the rocks and the stones will cry out, the beasts of the field will, the jackals and the ostriches, they will cry out. Verse 22, but you have not called upon me, O Jacob, and you have been weary of me, O Israel. You've not brought me the sheep for your burnt offerings, nor have you honored me with your sacrifices. I have not caused you to serve with grain offerings, nor wearied you with incense. We don't believe. We don't have faith. We don't come to him. We don't accept his sacrifice. We don't accept what he has already done. If we really did, God would be honored and glorified in us so much so that we'd be home already. The world would see, voice would go forward, but instead, what we're seeing in the world today, the devil is on the march, gaining more and more territory every day. More and more people are joining radically wrong groups than adjoining God's people. More and more laws in this country are going to perversions and obsessions and addictions and more and more people are asking for it more and more people are wanting it and more and more people are getting sucked down with it. If we really believed and had no fear, we'd go forward as God's witnesses boldly declaring, boldly demonstrating, boldly living God's word. Instead, we weary him with our grain offerings and our incense, thinking our little good works are all he asked for. Our little sacrifices are all he asked for. He has chosen us. He wants us fully, completely, 100% to be sold out for him. Not once a week, not twice a week, not for a few hours out of a day, but all day long, every day. He has called us. He has chosen us. We are his. Be not afraid. Be his witnesses. You have bought me no sweet cane with money, nor have you satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you've burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. As we continue in sin, as we continue sinning, as we don't believe by faith in his power to fully deliver us, when we don't believe that he has called us by his name, that he has married us, that he has adopted us, that we are one with him. We continue fooling around with the devil and fooling around with the world and committing a spiritual adultery against God. He's burdened with our sins. He's worn down with our sins. Our sins. He's wanting us to come home more than we're wanting to go home, obviously. Otherwise, we'd be there. He's saddened. He has already redeemed us. He has already paid the price. When will we believe? When will we accept? When we will receive the price paid and the sacrifice of the Messiah for us? When will we allow him to gain the victory over the sins in our lives? and to live for him, to witness for him.
to tell others about him? Are we bringing people who don't know the Lord to the Lord? When was the last time we shared with someone who doesn't know the Lord? When was the last time we told them about God? Or when was the last time we even lived out a, a dramatically demonstrated godly life to, to those who don't know? That's God's burden. God's burden is the loss of this world. Is that our burden too? Are we being his witnesses? Or are we being more of witnesses for the devil? Are people seeing more of our sinful nature? Or are they seeing more of God's nature lived out in us? God wants to fully redeem us. He's paid the full price for us. When we accept that, accept we are his children, claimed by his name, chosen for him, we'll move into his house, move in with him, live with him. When we believe he is with us and we stop having fears and worries and cares and selfishness, we will go forth with a burden for others. And the world will see him through us. And then the end shall come. When this gospel is preached in all the world, then the end shall come. ISIS in Iraq is getting its message out all the way to America and England and all parts of the world, and people from all parts of the world are going there to join them. Don't we have the same access to YouTube and, and, and Facebook and all other kind of things that they do to get the message out? How come people from all over the world aren't coming and flocking to God? Are we using these means? Are we using other means? Are we sold out for God? Verse 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. God redeems us for his sake, for his honor, for his glory. And he does it, he does not remember it, and if he does not remember it, we shouldn't remember it. Stop living in the past. Move on into the future. And if he doesn't remember it, he's delivered us from it. And it's there no more. Let's look at these wonderful promises. He tells us to fear not. Why? For I have redeemed you. For I have called you by your name. You are mine. I will be with you. I am the Lord your God. I am your Savior. I am the Holy One of Israel. I love you. You are precious in my sight. You have called me, called, you are called by my name. I created you for my glory. I have proven I alone can declare the future. Is that enough reasons not to fear? That's just from one chapter. Yes, 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 yes. We don't have to fear. Look at this list he gave us. He has proven himself. He is with us. There's nothing to fear. And we are his witnesses. Why? Because he has chosen us. None, of us. none were before him or after him. He is the Lord. He is the only Savior. He is our creator. He is our king. He has delivered us from Egypt, and he'll do it again. He has created a highway in the desert. And I will blot out your sins, and I will not remember them. We are his witnesses. Because he is the almighty, powerful God. He has chosen us. He's called us, and he commands us to go forward. And again, he doesn't command us to do anything that he doesn't give us the power to do. He can take away the fears, the worries, the cares, the depression, the sadness, the insecurities. Fill us with hope and joy and love, peace. Peace in our inner soul. Deliverance. Power, might, strength, glory. Give us the ability to rejoice and rejoice in the Lord always. No matter what the circumstances, no matter what the situation. People should look at us and go, why are you rejoicing so much? Instead of saying, what's troubling you? <laughs> so we pray together.
any fears on your heart, any worries on your heart, surrender them to the Lord. If there's any sins on your heart, surrender them to the Lord. Any lack of faith, any lack of trust, any insecurities, any doubts, surrender them to the Lord God. He's bringing to your mind, like the story Gloria read, go and visit that person, go visit that person, and the guy didn't do it, and she committed suicide. God's been impressing your mind that there's someone who needs to know the Lord. God's calling you to be his witness. God's created you, and he's redeemed you for this purpose. Ask him to demonstrate his love and his law through your life, his power through your life, his mercy and his grace, his truthfulness, and his consistency. To any area that applies to you as we pray together, our Lord and our God, King of the universe, ruler of all mankind, we thank you, Lord, for your work in the past. You have demonstrated you are almighty. You have demonstrated that nothing is impossible for you. Lord, forgive us for our unbelief. And help us in our unbelief. Remove the unbelief from us and give us full faith. Give us the faith of Messiah. Give us your mind. Live your life in us and through us. Thank you for being with us to the ends of this earth. And use us in getting your message out. By whatever means, to glorify you. In Yeshua's holy name, amen.